another good whistleblower. Kyle Serafin is here. He is an FBI whistleblower. The reason you know about, we all know about the story of the FBI going after uh, uh, parents at school boards is because of Kyle. He's the host of the Kyle Serafin Show. Kyle, how are you, brother? I'm good. How you doing, Mike? Thanks for having me on. I'm grateful you're here. I want to uh, talk about your experience, your six years in the FBI, what you blew the whistle on, other examples of corruption. But first, what is the FBI? Like, like what, what is it? What should it be? How did it start? Clearly, it had to have started with at least noble intentions. So maybe we should know what it was and what it could be, and then we can end up talking about how we get back to that perhaps noble beginning. So what, what was the FBI? So the FBI started in 1908 uh, by their own volition. Uh, it was known as the Bureau of Investigations and then eventually became the Federal Bureau of Investigations in the early 1930s. Uh, at that point, it was uh, run by a ge gentleman by the name of J. Edgar Hoover. Many people will know that name. I had somebody refer to him as Herbert Hoover the other day, different guy. Um, and J. Edgar Hoover was an interesting, very ambitious young man uh, and grew into kind of a crotchety old gangster in a lot of ways and was a just a troubling figure in American politics because in a lot of ways, he held the dirt on so many people um, all, so many politicians that they thought he was probably too powerful and obviously ran the bureau for his until he died. So an interesting kind of uh, original mission was to go after interstate crimes. These were the things that were violations of federal law that went between state boundaries that, uh, you know, superseded the, the uh, county boundaries where local law enforcement was restricted. And people got to remember in the 1930s, no internet, uh, no mutual aid, no NIM system, which is the National Incident Management System, no ability to uh, to transmit warrants in any meaningful way. Radio wasn't necessarily going to be uh, connected between different police departments. They wouldn't have the same frequencies. They wouldn't even have the same equipment. And so the ability of local law enforcement to coordinate with each other was very low. So the FBI kind of gave it an opportunity to go up to a higher level and have connectivity across different states. So maybe a, an okay mission to begin with. Um, but but went afoul of that in the 50s with the Coin Intel Pro, you know, had a lot of sins going all the way down to, you know, they, they encouraged Martin Luther King to kill himself. So Martin Luther King Jr. was a victim of the FBI in the 70s. There was a lot of bad things the FBI has done, but I think it was more the minority of the work that it did. And uh, and now we're seeing that uh, there's sort of this creep where it's not getting it's not getting better. It's getting worse. Yeah. When did it go from that role of facilitating into a role of a actively involved? And as we'll get to a little bit here, like targeting certain people and certain groups and types of people. When did that happen? I think there's always been kind of a little instinct. It, it, so it comes from intelligence work. Intelligence work is about information. It's about um, it's about getting the information regardless of what the legal process in, is involved in because there's no criminal prosecutions involved in intelligence work. Uh, the problem is, is when you do that with a law enforcement agency that also has guns and badges and powers to arrest, then you are now exposing some really you know, dangerous capabilities to a group that can also take away your freedom. Uh, the big thing that people are gonna notice as far as a turning point in, in most of our lifetimes was 9-11. And on September 12th of 2001, the FBI accepted the same mission, I think that a lot of the federal government did, and I think a lot of the military did, which was this, uh, this change in what the definition of national security means. They basically accepted that no American can die from terrorism on American soil and once you have that sort of zero fail mission, which you're always going to fail at, unfortunately, mm. you, you end up in this uh, very aggressive sort of police state situation, but it takes a while for that to grow. And we're now seeing sort of that that full grown experience of what it looks like to have that that uh, that change. Wow, in that's really interesting, really interesting. Really well said. So what should the definition be? Right. If not that, what what where what would be a healthier posture for the FBI to have now instead? Well, the historical definition of national security has always been the same thing. It's the same thing that uh, I swore as an enlisted guy in the Air Force and many people swore in the military, uh, you know, sheriffs swear, which is to say that you swear to the um, to the continuity of the American Federal Republic and you swear to uphold the Constitution and preserve it as our founding document and our and our super, you know, our supreme law of the land. So if you are mm. working at protecting the Constitution, people die when that happens and they have. They died in World War One and World War II. They died in Korea. They died in Vietnam. They died in Iraq. Uh, they died in Afghanistan doing the same sort of thing, keeping people from coming after our constitutional republic. When you start accepting zero deaths at home because of something that's very nebulous like terrorism, uh, then, you're, then you're accepting tyranny. That's terrifying. Yes, yes. You could justify anything, any means to achieve that end, if that's your, if that's your end. Wow, that's fantastic. Okay, I'm so grateful for that. Okay, what are, what's the first thing you blew the whistle on? 
Uh, so in uh, September 2021, uh, I, I said no to the COVID vaccine mandate, which was Executive Order 14043. And so I, I put in a religious exemption. I'm a pro-life Catholic and said, no, thank you. And then about two weeks, three weeks later, uh, sometimes you figure God has this weird plan that uh, you don't know how it's going to come down. But I get an email that wasn't designed for me. It was sent for supervisors. And it said that the FBI was creating a threat tag known as EDU officials uh, that was going to be targeting parents at school board meetings because I follow the news pretty religiously. My, my allegation actually was not that the FBI cannot do that because they can if there's credible threats. What they can't do is have an attorney general who said he's not going to use counterterrorism resources to go after parents and then get an email from the assistant director of counterterrorism saying that we've instituted the threat tag. And that's a guy named Carlton mm. Peoples. He was the EAD over there in, in CT, counterterrorism. So when that came down, my allegation was actually that he may have uh, perjured himself in front of Congress. Now, obviously, the, the underlying reason for the perjury would be a big problem. That's why he would do it. But uh, but the allegation has to be very specific, like a p possible violation of federal law. So not to get too technical, but that's where the whistleblowing came from. Very good. What's a threat tag? A threat tag is a lot like a hashtag on social media. It uh, it can be used in a certain file in a case. It could be on the entire case as well. And when you click through for a specific type of threat tag, it's going to give you all the intelligence, all the, uh, the documents in the FBI system that are associated with that particular tag, like I said, just like a hashtag. So if we type in EDU officials, we're going to get all the investigations of threats of violence to school board officials in the United States. And inevitably, those are all going to come from parents who were protesting at the school board meetings. Yeah. So putting the perjury aside, which is a big thing to put aside, uh, mm -hmm. do, what's the problem with the FBI uh, investigating and seeing if there's actually any real threats of violence against school board members? What's the problem with that, Kyle? What do you want there to be violence? So there's a bandwidth issue. Um, the FBI has a certain number mm -hmm. of people. They have a limited amount of focus, and there are actually declared minimums for every single assistant U.S. attorney to be able to prosecute cases. Uh, to be more specific, I have turned down credible threats of violence to federal officers in pursuit of doing their jobs. Like a guy showed up at a border patrol station, you know, got deported or got detained, was driven away by border patrol officers, and he said specifically, I'm going to come back with a gun and shoot and kill the people at this station. So that's pretty straightforward. It's in front of, you know, we got great witnesses. And uh, we had to decline it because of the bandwidth. The United States Attorney's Office takes on only the biggest cases, except January 6th. Um, they take on only the biggest cases of serious felonies um, that have imminent danger of violence. And they don't, well, we dismiss, you know, actual interstate threats all the time. That's what this would have to be. So there has to first be a federal nexus saying that, that these yes. parents were actually using like the internet or something to do the threat. And then we have to actually think it's credible enough to actually care to do it, which generally speaking, they wouldn't meet that threshold. Now, we talked in the first segment about entrapment and the history of FBI entrapment. What's your thoughts on that? And then I want to tie in another whistle you blew about the uh, radical, what is it, radical Catholic, what was the other radical word? Traditional Catholics, yep. Radical to RTC. <laughs> okay, but look, first entrapment. What, what, what's the FBI's history in this? Uh, the history is significant, and it's pretty well documented. There's a, an, an author that I've been quoting a lot. His name is Trevor Aronson. He wrote a book called The Terror Factory. And when I went to a specialty surveillance team, so for people's background, I spent uh, five years at Washington field office. Two of those, I was doing counterintelligence against the Chinese. And then I got to be assigned to a surveillance team, uh, which had a side mission of always being on call for counterterrorism cases. So I did a lot of counterterrorism cases for about three years, um, thousands and thousands of hours you know, combined on this. And the FBI's counterterrorism mission is one of those things, we talked about mission creep a little bit. Uh, it is a mission creep issue, but moreover, it's a manufacturing of these cases. And what they do is they generally find people who have the worst ideas and no means and ability. A lot of them are low IQ or down and out when it comes to finances. And they say something stupid online. The FBI needs to have counterterrorism cases for them to hit their metrics and their budgets. So they do. They have these cases because they they basically manufacture them by turning in UCs, giving money into this guy, you know, or girl, whoever has the terrible idea, and then allowing them to move forward. Now that started with Islamic terrorists, which is what uh, Trevor Aronson writes about, but that's played directly forward into the domestic terrorism sphere. So white supremacists or anti-government, anti-authority types, whatever those, you know, there's a lot of different tags in the bureau, but it's a hundred percent like put up jobs is the moral, it's the standard. Um, I told Julie Kelly at one point, your previous guest, I told her that I said that all FBI terrorism cases that I see right now are basically the moral equivalent of entrapment, even if they're not the legal equivalent, because there is a, a very narrow mm. definition the Bureau uses to skirt that. Wow, great point. So what, what 
could that look like instead? If you, if you were in charge of the FBI, what, what would you do instead of that? I would get rid of pre-crime, which is essentially what they're trying to do. Like anybody who's seen the Minority Report movie with uh, Tom Cruise and, you know, we don't get a red ball that says, you know, Mike is a, is a dangerous criminal who's going to go do this thing and he's going to go kidnap the governor or he's going to go shoot up a police station. What we get is uh, Mike was online tweeting or he was on Reddit and he said, you know, cops are bad and I don't like them and somebody should go mm. shoot those MFers up kind of thing, right? So you get this kind of, you go, oh, okay, well, that, that might be a problem. So then you go talk to the guy. Um, we could do law enforcement instead of doing intelligence. That'd be a big deal. But instead, they, they like to creep around. They like to build the case because the FBI is perversely incentivized to actually build these cases and bring them to prosecution. They get all kinds of what we call statistical accomplishments, uh, also known as stats. And by getting those stats, that's how the, the senior executives that run the field offices get their bonuses. And they get big bonuses. Wow. I mean, they're, they're five-figure bonuses on top of their already pretty decent you know, $212,000 salaries. So imagine that you're incentivized to have these cases. You're going to have people work those cases when they work for you, and they do. Yes. Wow. So I was going to ask the motivation of this, right? And is, is, it, the corruption. is it only that metric, or are there other ideological motives too? I think what you so my buddy who produces my podcast uh, says that a GS fifteen in the uh, in the FBI is someone who's never said no to a bad idea. Uh, everybody that's <laughs> running field office is above the GS fifteen level, so they're all yes people at this point. You know they've all said yes all the way up the line until they get into the top of it. Uh, and then the other pro the problem is that the FBI director is not really running the bureau. He actually let something drop on Brett Baer the other day. He said uh, I have oversight of the FBI, and that's probably true. So they, he, mm. in his own words, he said he's bubble wrapped and kept away from what goes on in the field. I think that's also true. So he gets this daily briefing. He's the figurehead. He prances around. But like, I don't think the Queen of England knew what was going on in England. You know, she didn't run the government. She's a figurehead. And that's the same thing with Chris Ray. The problem is, is that everybody expects wow. him to be running it. So if the guy is in charge, then, you know, then he's complicit. And if he's not, he's incompetent. And either way, I think the guy should be removed. It's just one of those things where... You can't have it both ways. You can't be ignorant of what's going on and still not be responsible in some way. So that's kind of my- So who is running it? Is it just this amoebic blob of its own energy? Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, the, the deep state is really more accurately called the administrative state. These are people that have progressed up, that have said yes to everything, that have, you know, oftentimes left their families for up to 18 months at a time and they put career ahead of, of what they've got going on at home so that they can build up yes. this pension at the end and or they can get a cush job. You know, our last deputy director is now running some sort of security apparatus at Disney. Um, our, our previous director, Louis Free, is at some kind of sneaky hedge fund and gave, you know, $100,000 to the Biden uh, grandchildren. So, uh, you know, they, they get these kind of cush gigs if they come out at the top, but you got to get all the way up the top. And there's only a few spots up there. So you got to say yes really hard yeah. and you yes. got to fight really hard. Wow, okay, 30 seconds. Uh, tell us about the religious, uh, tra traditional Catholic extremists or whatever this group. Yeah, notorious RTCs. So the Richmond Field Office put out an intelligence product that uh, one of my whistleblowers inside my little group found, gave it to me, I exposed it to Congress, and then I wrote a piece about it to understand what it was. But essentially they were saying that there's common cause between people who like the Latin mass and like pre-Vatican II Catholicism and white supremacists, which is patently absurd, which is why the FBI withdrew it. Not because they're embarrassed that... Uh, that they did it, they're embarrassed they got caught and we're gonna keep catching them. Hmm. And I wonder what type of entrapment would have happened if that wasn't whistleblown first. Yeah, got, uh, got well it. done, Kyle Serafin, fantastic. Wonderful to meet you, man. Let's definitely talk again. Everyone check out the Kyle Serafin Show. Thanks, brother. Hey, appreciate it, Mike. Hey, thanks for watching that clip about our special on the FBI. Forever, my thoughts on the FBI were like, I don't know, I guess they're okay. But the more I learn, man, the more red flags there are out there and there's still so much to find out. So great special, talk to an FBI whistleblower, talk to someone who's suing the FBI because they're not forthcoming with the truth. Talk to an expert about January 6th, talked all about Gretchen Whitmer, it was a really great special. It's called Departments of Corruption. You can download it, uh, you can watch it on the, our app, the First TV app for free. Just download the First TV and you can watch it there or thefirsttv.com.